People often ask, where is my self-driving car? Why don't I have one, and when will it come? A lot of people feel they were promised a car by the late 20-teens, and it's late, and perhaps isn't coming, like the flying cars talked about decades ago. I'm Brad Templeton from Robocars.com. In this video, I'll explore the core reasons you probably aren't riding in a Robocar today, and when it might happen. I'll look at the core technological, legal, and social issues standing in the way, and why your expectations were wrong or right. I'll also look at some of the things that people think are in the way, but generally aren't. For most of us, these cars can't get here soon enough. They have the promise of avoiding a decent fraction of today's car accidents, which kill over a million each year around the world. They will make our lives easier and rewrite the principles of transportation. In doing that, they will rewrite where we live and the very nature of the city, as well as dozens of other industries from energy to retailing. Every day we delay getting these things out on the road in volume, thousands will die at the hands of people who shouldn't have been driving. Every day we delay. To be clear, the biggest reason that it's taking so long is that it's hard. One of the grandest software research projects ever undertaken. It has required not just breakthrough software, but also tons of detailed work down in the weeds, dealing with vast numbers of special cases and mapping the world. Anybody who thought or thinks it can be delivered on a schedule is wrong, and never worked in software before. When car companies threw out dates like 2020, those were hopes, not predictions. And that some of the tech companies actually pulled that off was amazing. Multi-year projects requiring breakthroughs are never predicted accurately. Nobody with a software background would be at all shocked if predictions for such a grand project made many years ago weren't accurate. So things are not behind schedule, even if they did not meet optimistic hopes. This also means that things are being done in smaller steps. So what are some of the key things that we're still waiting for? This is a two-part series, so we'll begin with one of the biggest blockers here in part one. The first technological goal was, of course, to make it happen. To make a car that can drive itself safely. That's a massive achievement. But at least in simple cities, a few companies have already pulled that off. Driving more safely than the average human has been done by companies like Waymo on the easy streets of Phoenix. That was the hard part. But the even harder part is defining what safety is, measuring it, and proving you've done it. You need to prove it to yourself, to your board, to your lawyers, to the public, and maybe even the government. Just as the Moderna COVID vaccine was ready in February 2020, before the first lockdowns, the world waited 10 months while a million people died without it, before letting the first people get a shot. We waited for them to prove that they had done it. And measuring safety is pretty hard. We know how often human drivers have crashes of all types, from minor dings up to fatalities. Fatalities happen about every 80 million miles in the USA, or about 2 million hours of driving. We can't test every software version by saying, let's have it drive a billion miles and see if it kills fewer than a dozen people, that would, the ones who would die if humans drove that far. It's an impossible distance to drive on real roads each time. We might drive much less and count dings and minor crashes. In fact, this is the best we've come up with so far, because it's at least possible but we're sh not sure if that relates to injuries with robots the same way it does with people. We start the traditional auto industry way. We test each component of our vehicles to make sure it's reliable and up to specification. We try to do that with systems of components, but that methodology becomes different when things get more complex. This is called functional safety. Are the components and systems free of defects, and will they handle known potential failures? More recently, there's been more effort to bump this up to a systems level and try to test what's called safety of the intended functionality. With SOTIF, teams work to assure whole systems will still function, both with problems 
and with anticipated misuse. This often involves simulation of the whole system, or parts of it, or hardware-in-the-loop simulation that is easier and safer than live testing on the roads. Simulation testing offers the ability to test a system in millions of different scenarios. Anything anybody has ever seen, or heard of, or dreamt of, with hundreds of slight variations of all those things. Perhaps the hardest thing to test, but the thing you most want to know, is how well a system responds to never-before-seen situations. Well, you can create simulation testing to know the vehicle does well in almost all expected situations, the one magic ability of human minds is the capacity to handle never-before-seen problems. AIs can do this, but they're not quite as good as we are. Eventually, we should hope for a way to get new, realistic, dangerous scenarios every day. It's good today your car has been programmed to handle everything anybody has ever thought of. But the real gold standard may be to throw 20 new situations it's never seen before every day at it and find out if it handles most of them. Even humans don't handle all of them. That's one thing I hope to see happen through the Safety Pool Project, which I helped initiate with the World Economic Forum, Deepin.ai, and the University of Warwick. Even with all the simulation, you also need to test live on the road. Nobody is going to deploy a car that hasn't shown that it handles the real world very well. While expensive, the system of using human safety drivers to oversee robocar operations actually has a superb track record and does not endanger the public compared to ordinary human driving. In the industry, every company falls over itself to describe how devoted they are to safety. It is their job to make a safe vehicle, but they make these declarations to please officials and the public Ironically, the public interest is not to make the safest robocars, but rather the safest roads. Robocars are a tool that can bring safer roads, and the sooner they get here, the sooner and better they will do that. Officials, if they took their duty towards improving overall road safety seriously, would be actually encouraging companies to not go overboard on safety, and instead focused on the quickest deployment of safer technology. Even if doing less to prove it's safe, while deployment is small, makes it happen faster. But the officials never will. A second component of safety is cybersecurity. We do need these cars to be robust against attempts to take them over. People don't like to talk about cybersecurity, but the past history of the auto industry has not been great. Doing this involves not just secure practices and tools, but also what's called red teaming, where a team of expert hackers hunts from the outside to find vulnerabilities until they can't find any more. One other important tool is minimizing connectivity, or what security people call attack surfaces. Many in the industry are obsessed with what they imagine is the connected car and see the connectivity as as big a revolution as the self-driving. It isn't, not remotely. Some connectivity is needed, but it should be used sparingly so the real revolution can stay secure. One of the biggest challenges for testing is the wide use of machine learning by all robocar teams. Machine learning is a hugely powerful AI tool, and most feel it is an essential one, but it tends to produce black box tools which make decisions which nobody fully understands. If you don't know a system is working, or why it fails, or does the right thing, it's hard to test and certify it. In Europe, they've been making laws demanding that all AI be explainable at some level, but many machine learning networks are very hard to explain. That's scary because they are so powerful that we won't give them up. We may be faced with a black box that's twice as safe as testing in an explainable system, and there are compelling arguments people make in favor of either choice. A robocar is covered with sensors, such as cameras, radars, LiDAR lasers, and more. Sensors are probably the most discussed aspect of the hardware. But in fact, sensors don't tell you what you want to know at all. That's because sensors tell you where things are right now. But you don't care about that. You care where things are going to be in the future. The information from sensors is just a clue towards the real goal of predicting the future. Knowing where something is and how fast it's moving is a good start. But knowing what it is is just as important for knowing where it will be. Most of the objects on or near the road are not ballistic. A human is in charge and can change course. That's why one of the key areas of research today 
is getting better at predicting what the others on the road, in particular the humans, are going to do. This can range from knowing driving behavior to figuring out if a pedestrian standing on the corner is about to enter the crosswalk or is just surfing the web. Ironically, the company that made this video recently went out of business because it's hard to sell perception tools as a startup, but it's a very important function. While several teams have made great progress, it turns out that people are better than today's robots at predicting other people. Getting better at that is one of the key problems on the to-do list, particularly in more complex environments like busy cities. Predicting the future also involves predicting how others will react to your own movements and the predicted movements of others. A lane merge or an unprotected left turn can be a dance with give and take, and robocars will consistently be trying to improve how they do. Sensors may only be a means to the real goal of predicting the future, but the better they do, the better you are at predicting the future. Teams are still looking to make sensors faster to make perception and prediction faster. One thing that's important is knowing the speed of moving objects. Radar tells you that, but cameras and older LiDARs don't, unless you look at multiple frames. Some newer LiDARs can tell you the speed as well as distance. Looking at multiple frames takes at least as much time as looking at the frames and recording them, but usually more. One situation that can be a problem is moving on the highway behind a bigger vehicle. Imagine that ahead of that vehicle is a truck stalled on the shoulder, sticking out into your lane. That happens with accidents and emergency vehicles a lot. Suddenly the big vehicle before you veers right to avoid the obstacle, and you see it for the first time. You really don't have much time to brake or veer, and you may not even have anywhere to go. If you have to look at three frames of video to see that it's indeed not moving, that's probably a tenth of a second wasted, and this is a situation where it can matter. So a lot of teams are looking for ways to get that edge, and they have found it mostly in LiDARs that can measure Doppler to know the speed of everything they hit with the laser. Radars also do that and know the speed too, but the world is full of stopped objects reflecting radar, and it's hard to tell the stopped vehicle from the stopped guardrail right next to it. I will briefly mention that a reason one famous team, Tesla, isn't ready yet is that they're trying to deliberately make the problem harder. While every team makes heavy use of computer vision, Tesla wants to make it work with only computer vision and only cameras from 2016. Most other teams also add better cameras, LiDAR, radar, and maps to their toolbox. Tesla wants a vision breakthrough to do it cheaper. They say all those extra tools are distractions, but the rest of the industry wants to use all the tools to get it done sooner, if at greater cost, and think Tesla is crippling itself. So far, based on the quality of the product, Tesla FSD is seriously far behind. The others are right, though the race is not finished. That's part one. Coming soon in part two, a look at things like being a good citizen of the roads, why robocars are being deployed one town at a time instead of everywhere at once, the problems of dealing with more mundane logistics like pulling over to pick up riders, business models, apps, and worrying too much about safety while getting governments and the public to accept you. I will also list a few factors that are being worked on but are not real blockers to deployment. So stay tuned for part two, and if you like this, please click like and subscribe.